Welcome to Growth Track again. This is Daniel in Revelation class. This is session number six, and uh, this is uh, part of Growth Track for Church of the Heartland. If you would like uh, college credit for this class, go to churchoftheheartland.com and click on the Growth Track link, uh, big black logo, and there is an application there and a code of conduct, and you can do that and uh, get actual Bible college credit. If not, you can just check this video out and take in the information. All right, let's open in prayer. Lord Jesus, Thank you for this time in your word. I pray, God, that it makes sense to us and that you illuminate it into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We are going to Revelations chapter 4 and 5 for this section. Uh, Revelations chapter 4 and 5. We just ended with the seven churches of the book of Revelation, and now we're getting into where I believe uh, kicks off the, the, the rest of the timeline. So let's look at this timeline so far. Chapter 1, Jesus. And you could even read into that maybe the times of Jesus. And then you have the seven churches of Revelations, which starts out with the, the, uh, the people that were left over right after Jesus ascended, the apostolic age. And then it ends with Laodicea. It ends with, some, with the modern day, right where we're at, where we have to fight off this lukewarm spirit and make sure that we uh, love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, after this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had heard, first heard speak to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now that is a very critical verse in the book of Revelations. Incredibly critical. Verse 2, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was the throne of heaven. Okay, so I'm going to slow this down a little bit because all a lot happened right there. Chapter 4, verse 1. As I looked, there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Now, remember, Jesus said, the last days will be like the days of Noah. And the Lord shut the doors of the ark. And he shut the people, the righteous people, and saved the righteous people. And the Bible says, I think it's Genesis chapter 6, that the Lord shut the doors of the ark. The door meaning the rapture. This is where I believe the rapture takes place in the book of Revelation. And I'll show you some other reasons why I believe that. The voice I heard at first speaking to me like a trumpet, like a trumpet, right? Um, the trumpet is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It's mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 16. Both of those early verses I think we dealt with in sessions 1 and 2 about the rapture. We're talking about a trumpet, and here we go. The voice like a trumpet, and the door open in heaven. Notice what it says here. Come up here. Come up here. Shh. Come up here. Okay, once again, we're getting rapture terminology. And I will show you what must take place after this. I believe the rest of the book of Revelation is primarily what takes place after the rapture. Up until this point in time, we had Jesus, the seven eras, and now we have the rapture, and we're heading into, at this point, our, our future. We ended in Laodicea with the present day. Now we're heading into the future. Um, at once I was in the spirit. Remember back in that session we talked about the rapture being in the twinkling of an eye, the word atomos, right? The atomic second. We have that alluded to again here. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was the throne in heaven. At the, the idea of the instant timing of the rapture. The next thing you see is the throne of heaven. All right? Make sense? <clears throat> Okay, and there and talks about the throne and how amazing it is. And then in verse 4, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. All right, the 24 elders. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of debate about who these guys are. Matter of fact, if any of these sessions, if you disagree with me on some of this, this is just my studying. This is just some stuff that I've read. Uh, sure, you know, feel free to disagree. Like we talked about in earlier sessions, Please disagree from a learned perspective, not just from something you don't like, you know, so have a reason why you disagree from the Bible. But I believe these 12 elders, uh, 24 elders, to be two groups, two groups of 12. You have the, the first 12 was the uh, tribes of Israel, the tribes of Israel, and that represents the Old Testament. The next 12, you have the apostles, as in like Jesus' apostles, and those represent the New Testament. So you have 24 elders. Now, 
whether there are actually 24 elders or whether this is more an allusion to the idea of the Old Testament and the New Testament merging together around the throne. It means that, that, means that the Bible and all the people of God are one people. That's, that's, what you're, that's what he's getting at here. The people that have gone way before and the people that are part of this new religion, this is one people in the sight of God represented by the 24 elders. I'm okay with it being considered those are actually 24, but I want you to get the, uh, the concept is that this is, uh, this is one group of people. That's why when we preach on Moses, it has meaning to our lives. That's not a different religion to us, is it? David, King David, wasn't a different religion. So in our hearts, the, the, 12, old, old, the 12 Old Testament leaders, those are our leaders too. And, and the 12 New, the New Testament leaders, those are our leaders too. So that's the idea, the word of God being one group of people um, spread over that. Okay, so yeah, 24 elders, and that's who I believe them to be. They were dressed in white, had crowns of gold on their heads. From, their, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder in front of the throne wow i mean can you imagine what this is going to be like can you i i mean john is raptured at this point he's taken up come up here the door is opened up and here he is seeing all this friends can you imagine what it's going to be like to see all this Words aren't going to describe, and, and you can get that idea here from John's writings. He's just trying to put into words what's blowing his mind. Which is, it's too much to even handle. Our, our, our senses are just, you know, our five senses, we're beyond that. We're way into another level of understanding. Um, and I just, I, just, when I just stop and think about how beautiful that is. Uh, but, you know, let me tell you. The real reason I want to be in heaven is not because it's got streets of gold and uh, mansions like John 14 says we all have, and it's because Jesus is there. Right? Mm -hmm. Everything we do is so this moment takes place, friends, and we look into the eyes of Jesus, and he says the words that my whole life is, uh, um, I can't, this is the whole purpose of my life. Well done, good and faithful servant. I don't care about anything else. I want to hear Jesus say those words. At every sacrifice, it's all going to seem like nothing when Jesus says those words to us, friends. Amen. Amen. So moving on here, um, there are seven spirits of God. Uh, let's see, this is in verse 5. It's the blazing lamps. There are seven spirits of God. Once again, that is uh, not the seven. That's more the idea of the Holy Spirit and uh, from Isaiah chapter 11 the seven attributes of the Spirit of God. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. Okay, now here's what we got to understand about the book of Revelation. It's, it's writing in like a poetic type of writing, okay? So is, is it literal or not literal? That's really not the point. We got to get to what God's really saying is, is more important. So whether these creatures are actually like eyes, like, oh, you poked me in the eye. Oh, you poked me in the eye. Oh, stop that. I don't like being poked in the eye. Um, eyes represent knowledge. And every time you see something with, with uh, like seven eyes, which we're, I think we're going to look at here in a second, you're looking at a creature that sees everything, an all-seeing creature, an all-seeing being. It, it's mentioned that Jesus has those kinds of things. So the, the, the alliteration here is, uh, and I, we'll explain what these creatures are. Um, there is four of them, and uh, let's, use the, uh, let's use the board. There are four living creatures. We're back to blue. Um, the first one is a lion. Okay, first we have a lion. Now, the, no, we don't have four lions. We have but one lion. Okay, first one we have the lion. Um, the lion is the greatest of the wild animals, okay? This is the greatest of the wild animals. Number two, you have the ox. The ox is the greatest of the tamed animals. Number three, I think I'm running out of room here. Let's go over here. You have man the greatest of all creation. And number four, you have the eagle, the greatest of the birds. 
This is representing everything God's made. So when we look here, we see the four beasts, the lion, the ox, the, the face of a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, uh, even under its wings. Day and night, they, they uh, never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy. I'm in verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is, is to come. The point here is all of creation, all of creation is praising God. The greatest of the untamed animals or the wild animals, the greatest of the tamed animals, man itself, the eagle, the greatest of the birds, everything is praising God. That's why when you go out and take in a, a nature, a, a, a landscape, you can just feel the presence of God and it just hits you. That is this idea right here. They're crying out. Even creation itself is crying out. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Isn't that beautiful? So if you look at it, this is we're, we're working kind of in an order here. You've got all of the Old Testament and the New Testament leaders, all the people of God of all time, crying out, holy and perfect is our God. We have also all of creation mentioned with the four creatures, great is our God. The idea is heaven is filled with the praises of everything, not just the praises of human beings to the Lord. It's with the praises of everything to the Lord. Okay? Now, um, uh, let's go to chapter 5 now. Okay, chapter 5 is filled with all kinds of cool stuff, and I'm looking forward to kind of sharing this with you here. Um, so the rapture took place in chapter 4, and as soon as he arrives there, he's seeing all this worship to the Lord. He's taking it in. He's seeing the people of God worshiping. He's seeing nature worshiping. Everything is bowing down, saying how great God is. He's taking in the thunder and the lightning and the, the rainbow skies. And, and then in chapter 5, we're here for the purpose now. So chapter 4 was kind of giving you an understanding of what he's looking at. Now 5 starts the storyline. Uh, verse 1, then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Okay, so let me erase this here. We have a, uh, the man who sat on the throne had a scroll with seven seals. Now, my art skills are so bad. Oh my gosh, are they bad. So I'm going to kind of give you an idea what this looks like, but... Use a lot of your imagination. Okay. If this was like, uh, you know, uh, win, lose, or draw, it's, it's going to be lose. Okay, so you've got, you've got a scroll. Okay, you've got a scroll. And then you've got these seals around. You've got like, if you look at a Roman scroll, they have these seals on them. And um, they would wrap them with a ribbon, and then they would take wax and they would put it on there, and they would seal it with the Roman seal. Now, what they would do is they'd give that to a messenger, and that messenger would take that seal, uh, take that scroll to who it was supposed to go to. So let's say the, 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 the Caesar took the, wrote, a, wrote a thing to the governor of Egypt. I want you to invade this other place. And he'd take it, he'd wrap it up, and then he'd put a seal on it. And if that seal was broken... When that messenger got to the governor of Egypt, that messenger was dead. Because that means he opened it up and looked, up, looked into it ahead of time. Does that make sense? The more important a document was, the more it was sealed. So seven, uh-oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven seals is saying this is a very important document. Very, very important document. So let's go back, knowing what this is, let's go back to chapter 5, verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? In other words, you see, who is worthy to open such a document? Who is worthy to open it? Especially God, this is, this, this we're going to find out, this scroll is the judgment of God. Who is worthy to open this document. Well, here, let's, let's watch this. It's so cool. But no one, verse 3, in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. 
So no one was worthy. Verse 4, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then, verse 6, one of the elders said to me, don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. Jesus is worthy to open the scroll and the seven seals. Now, I'm, 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 exp I'm going somewhere here, so, so keep, keep track with me. In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist, a different John, uh, Jesus' cousin, sees Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the idea that there had to be a perfect lamb sacrifice was understood by these first Christians. So when they say here, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. I'm in verse, what is this, 6. The lamb had, okay, we'll go, we'll go after this second. Okay, so who's open, who is able, who's capable of opening these seven seals? Well, only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only the lamb of God who was slain before the foundations of the earth. Now, friends, I want to explain why. Let's go back to verse 5. I want to explain why this is so important. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David. Okay, we know uh, that Jesus was called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. We know that Jesse was David's father in the Old Testament. Jesse was David's father, and that they called Jesus in the New Testament the son of David. So we know who they're talking about right here. Who is worthy to open the scroll? Only Jesus is worthy to open it. Now, I want you to think about this. Why, why is Jesus the only one worthy to open this scroll? Because he was once a man. Who can really judge human beings? You know, people say, oh, you can't judge me. Don't judge me. There was one being who walked this earth as a human being and was 100% God and 100% man, and he is worthy to open the scrolls, my friend. So, so the idea of, uh, of who's worthy, I think this is really, really critical because every religion has some sort of apocalypse, has some sort of doomsday type stuff. Islam has it, Judaism has it, Christianity has it, but I'll tell you, only one has someone who's actually worthy to do such a judgment. Jesus. Because he has, quite literally, been there and done that. He's walked in our shoes, he's been tempted as a man in every way a man could be tempted. And he said no to those temptations and said no to every single uh, sin opportunity. So he knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to say no to that temptation. So when, G when Jesus judges us, it is fair because he was there. He's been there, done that. So a lot of times when we look at, especially as we go into these next uh, couple sessions, when you look at the judgment that's going to be poured out upon humanity, it looks pretty harsh. But remember, Jesus is worthy to open the scroll because he's been there and done that. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's see. The lamb had seven horns. I'm in verse six. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. Okay, remember back in Daniel, what did the horn represent? A ruler, authority and power. So seven is the number of perfection. Seven is the number of perfection. So seven horns, complete, absolute, total authority. Seven eyes. Does Jesus have seven eyes? No. Yes and no, I guess. The seven eyes mean he sees everything. Now, these are important because a lot of different non-Christian, but yet kind of Bible-y type people they believe that Jesus was a good guy. They believe that Jesus was a good prophet. They believe Jesus was a nice guy. They do not believe that he has all authority because only God has that. They do not believe he sees everything because only God has that. And it's really important for all of us to realize that Jesus has God attributes. He's God is what is being said here in Revelation chapter 5. Okay, so now I'm in uh, chapter 5 verse 7. 
He went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures, okay, representing all creation, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Okay, I got a little bit to explain here. So he grabs the scroll and says, who's worthy? And Jesus is like, uh, I'm, I'm the one that's supposed to do this. From the Father, he grabs the, he grabs the, the scroll with the seven seals, which is the, the great tribulation, honestly. It's the great uh, trouble that's coming. He grabs the scroll, and all of a sudden, everybody erupts. Everybody erupts. All the 24 elders fall down. I mean, everybody starts praising God because they know it's almost over. They know that, remember, the rapture has happened, and they know they're kicking off the timeline that ends with the second advent. It ends with the coming of the Messiah and his rule on the earth and the actual kingdom of God being established on the earth. Man, isn't that cool? I might not be portraying it well, but I'm getting excited about this. <laughs> it might not be coming off, but in my heart and mind, I can see this. And it, it just is, uh, it's so exciting. Now, uh, another little thought here in, let's see, I'm in verse eight. Um, these are the prayers, the, hit, uh, the holding the golden bowls, and full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Just a little side thought. All the prayers that we've ever prayed are still in the hands of God right now. They're before the Lord right now. The bowls are holding the prayers that we prayed. So maybe you prayed something a long time ago and you thought, oh, God didn't hear this one. The, 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 the incense bowls are filled with the prayers of the saints from all time. They've been filling up and filling up and filling up the bowls of prayer that are before the Lord. Uh, now let's go to verse nine. They sang a new song. It's the first time they sang it. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nations. Uh, time out right there. I'll tell you, there was a man. He used to be the head of the Ku Klux Klan. And I got to meet him and he came actually to one of our churches years ago. He was the uh, national leader of the Ku Klux Klan. And he got saved. And did you know it was that verse right there that led him to Christ? Because he, he realized heaven has people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Heaven is uh, ethnically diverse. He thought it was just white people. <laughs> he was like, well, if heaven's there, then there's nothing wrong with these people. Well, duh. <laughs> he ended up getting saved, realizing the, uh, the error of his ways, completely flipping 100%. His name was Johnny Lee Clary, if you want to Google it. 100% uh, flip to, uh, to being a person that opens acceptable to everybody. Um, but that verse right there was the one that changed his whole heart uh, about, um, about people. So back in verse 9, because you were slain, Jesus, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's you and me, friends. You have made them to be, verse 10, a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Verse 11, then I looked and there heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and the sea and all that's in them say to him who sits on the throne and to the land be praise, honor, and glory and power forever. And the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. So look at our timeline, what we went over here today. Started with Jesus, went through the seven eras of the church. Chapter four, verse one and two, the rapture takes place. He's taking in heaven and what it looks like and who's there. We have the 24 elders, the two groups of 12. From the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have the four living creatures. We represent all uh, creation itself praising God. And now we have in chapter 5, who's worthy to open the scroll? Jesus Christ is the only one worthy because he was once a man. And he's about to open these scrolls. Now as we go into these next couple sessions, each of these scrolls will be unlocked one at a time. And every it's like a little bit, just a little bit opens every time. Every time a little bit opens, great tribulation comes out. Uh, great, uh, something bad happens, basically. But I believe the Christians do not experience this because this particular judgment comes upon those who have rejected God, and that's why it's coming. 
They've said no to God. They said, I don't want anything to do with God. And that's why it's coming. So when we talk about the, the seals and we're going to break the seals the next, uh, the next uh, session, that is explaining the idea of breaking these seals right here so that the judgment begins to basically seep out as every one of them is broken. Okay? All right. So uh, that kind of wraps up our session here for today. Um, if you have questions, you can email me. Uh, there, you can pass or hide at gmail.com and I'll, uh, I'll answer any questions. Once again, if you disagree with me, please have a reason for doing so. All right, we'll see you next time.